So if we were in the Old Testament, that's kind of how we would do it. Um, and, and, you know, we might look at this and saying, well, those people, they just, they don't get it. You know what? They do get it. They understand you don't come to God without a sacrifice. And, and uh, that's the kind of sacrifice that was required of their God. And, and our God, too. It's just that our God said, I'm going to be that sacrifice. And he came in the form of Jesus Christ and became that lamb that you saw slaughtered for our sin. To me, it's, it, I look at this and I see people who are desperately sincere in reaching out to God. And then I look at us and I see people who, whom God has reached out to and we lack the fervor and we lack the intensity. And we get a little upset when life gets messy. Talk about messy. Uh, and yet we have so very much to be thankful for. And this morning I want to go a little bit further and look at the instructions that were given to the priests. Because in that sacrificial system, it was necessary for priests to come into the place and, and to go between the worshiper and God. And there were certain activities that the priest had to do for them, as we saw here. But um, today in the New Covenant, then we have a different... Uh, uh, we actually are priests. Not next Sunday, but in two weeks from today, we're going to look at our role as the priest. Uh, and, but th today, I want us to look in... Uh, Leviticus chapter 6, and we'll begin reading from verse 8. When you're studying a book in the Bible, you'll notice it's divided up to, into chapters and verses, and that's, that's a good thing. It helps us for me to be able to tell you where we're going to begin reading, uh, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 8. But uh, the division of chapters and, and so forth in the scriptures is not really, it's not really all the time hitting on a... Uh, Sometimes the divisions are unnatural. That would be the case here. Actually, we sh this should be a new, if I was doing it, of course nobody asked me, but if I was doing it, this would be where a new chapter would begin with chapter 6 and verse 8. And here's what the scripture says. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offering." The burnt offering shall be on the hearth on the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen undergarment on his body. And he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has, been, has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it, and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. Then he goes on, and from here, and, and this from here to the end of chapter 7, to explain to the priest what do you do with the offering, because, uh, again, here they have the convergence of two mountain streams, or I should say in, in, the, in Nepal, they have the convergence of two mountain streams, and a lot of the residue just kind of goes right on down the mountain, and so later on, as people wash their clothes down the mountain, that's what they get to wash their clothes in, and if you heard Pastor Freeman say that above this place where they were doing this sacrifice, they were actually washing the animals above it, then you come down, you see these men who are washing themselves, getting, uh, the, uh, purifying themselves in the water, and, and then it goes on down the stream. So, so uh, in this whole purification process here, there's, it's, it's, just, it's just all messy. And think about it. Now, after the sacrifice has been made, what do you do with the waste? What do you do with the waste? When you burn an ox or a lamb or a goat on the altar there, and, of course, the fire is supposed to be hot and intense, and it all goes up. But there's residue. 
Now, that residue was offered to God. There's a holiness there. Once it hits that altar, there's a holiness about that, uh, about that sacrifice. And it's all burnt up, and so now what do you do with it? What do you do with the ashes? Where are you going to put it? And so it's holy, and since it is holy, it cannot be kept in the camp. It must be taken outside of the camp, but it's not just dumped in the dump, in the trash bin. It's taken to a clean place and has to be properly disposed of in a holy and clean manner. Now, there's specific instructions that are given here as to how that's to be done. The priest, when he goes to clean the altar, he wears his priestly clothes. There are certain clothes that the priest needs to wear when he comes to do his priestly functions. And so he goes to the altar, he cleans it, and uh, takes out um, uh, the ashes and so forth, being very careful that the fire does not go out. Once the ashes have been cleaned, then he changes clothes, collects the ashes, because he's going to be leaving the temple area, the holy place, and go, takes the ashes outside of the city to a pre predetermined clean place, as opposed to being unclean. We're getting into that later on in the book of Leviticus between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. And, and so it's specified a clean place. And there he leaves the ashes, comes back then, changed back into his priestly garment, prepares the wood on the altar uh, for the new day, and then immediately a sacrifice is made. Immediately a sacrifice uh, is made to begin the day. So as we, as we look at this then, uh, these instructions are given particularly to the priests because the sacrificial system required that a qualified person who knows about the sacrifices and knows the systems and knows the rituals should do that. Uh, it, and, and just let me give you a little example. Uh, in a churches today, they have wedding organizers, people who do weddings as a ministry or even as a job. Why? Because they're supposed to know all about the ritual, right? And uh, I have oftentimes counseled couples who have come to me about their wedding, and, they, and so I ask them, how do you want to do it? And um, most of them don't have a clue, and others have some wild and crazy ideas. And I say, well, let me give you some suggestions, okay? And then I talk about the ritual of marriage and what the different meanings are and why we do these things and, and, and that kind of thing, and explain it to them. And then they begin to understand, oh, okay, uh, and, and, and that's how we go about doing it. Well, there has to be somebody who knows, knows the meaning and the rit behind the rituals, and that was the role of the priest to be able to do that kind of thing. They existed in a very difficult situation. They're in between because they stand between the worshiper and God. On the one side, you have a holy, righteous God. On the other side, you have a worshiper who wants to come and make a connection with God. You stand in between. You, you want to do what's right for the worshiper. There's certain protocol you need to follow. But my soul, you better be doing what's right when you're approaching a holy God. And so they're in this, this in-between land, and uh, it's, it's, it's an honor, of course. But they are the picture of the holy to the people. And they are then the picture of that go-between between God and, people, and, and God's people. We in the new covenant, that's us, we're under a new covenant. This new covenant, we, we don't use our, uh, I am not the priest, okay? Uh, let's get that right. I am not Father Homer, although I am Father Homer. I am not that Father Homer, all right? I am even Grandfather Homer, so you could call me the Grand father, but not, that, not, not the kind of father that many people call the guy who stands up here. So uh, I'm, I'm a pastor. I get to, and, there's, and in the New Testament, there's requirements for pastors too, but it's not like there's a, an elevated spiritual position like there is for the priest. And so today, as Christians in this new covenant, we don't have a human who stands between us and God. Today, as as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, only one, and that is Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between God and man. That is the man Christ Jesus. And so he's our high priest. For us, we, we all have equal access to God through our high priest in this, in this new covenant. And in fact is, uh, we have all been, as believers, we have all been elevated to the position of priest. 
look what the scripture says. And, and this takes on a bit of a more, a, a lot more meaning when we understand it in terms of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says this. As you come to him, speaking about Jesus, because he's a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Now, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The worshiper couldn't do that before. The worshiper prepares, but the priest makes the sacrifice. Now we as priests, we then make a spiritual sacrifice. The fact that we can make that spiritual sacrifice means that we then are a part of this priesthood. Think about that for a while. Now we come in this position of betwixt and between. We stand between a holy God and a people who are not priests who might be wanting to see and find a way to a holy God, we as priests need to know how then to bring them together in that end. So the instructions then to handle are to the priests are given to how to handle each of these sacrifices, and they need to know these procedures. And what I'd like you to notice particularly today is how the priests have to pay attention to the fire that's on the altar. We talked about the blood. Only the priests handle the blood. Now we come to the fire. There's certain things, themes that are starting to come out. One is the sacrifice. We spent time on the sacrifice. And the other is, is, is the blood. And, and, and now we, we look at the fire. And, and uh, these the certain themes start to come out. And three times, three times in that passage of Scripture, God says to these priests, verse 9, he says, The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And then when we look at the next verse, he says uh, in, in uh, chapter, chapter 6, verse 12, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. And then once again, hey, listen, folks, when God says something three times, you know, your parents, you know, you know, when you mean something and you repeat it again and you repeat it a third time, A wise child will understand. Mom and dad are saying this, and you better catch it. If you're a student in class, it's the same thing. If a professor keeps saying something over and over, you should probably record it in your notes. God says this three times. Fire doesn't go out. Keep the fire burning. So um, it's important then that this should be a perpetual thing, this fire. Now, once again, let me point out to you that the the idea and the concept of the perpetual fire is nothing new or exclusive to the Jews. They're not the only ones to have this uh, perpetual fire. Um, I read where it says, among the Persians and among the Parsis in India at this day even, fire was and is the visible representative of the Godhead. The continual burning of it, then, is an emblem of eternity. The perpetual fire of Vesta, who's the oldest goddess, among the Greeks and Romans, was the emblem of the inmost, purest warmth of life, which unites family and people. The hearth, as it were, or the heart of a house or of a state. It's shown that these are the perpetual in their worship. The perpetual sacrificial fires were common amongst ancient people. Why, why do I belabor this point? The reason is this, folks. Uh, sometimes we have this exclusive idea that we're the only ones who got it right. No. We are the ones who come through this line of people that God in his providence and his mind, he chose. He says, I chose you because I chose you. Not because you're better than anybody else. And I am showing you my way through this people so that all peoples now can know the process, the way, the path, the ritual by which you can come into the presence of a holy God. How is God going to reveal himself unless he chooses a way to show us? And folks, 
Someday you can ask him why he chose the Jews and not the Chinese or the Germans. Me being somewhat German, but having a... <clears throat> so, why is that? You'll have to ask him. But God's choice, choice was this, and from these people came the Messiah, who in a, a wonderful miracle came through the, the Jewish people, and we have a Messiah today. And, and there, it, it behooves us to look to them, but I, I say this to say that uh, we shouldn't have an exclusive attitude that we're the only ones. And by that, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I want to be very careful here, because I believe that Jesus is the only way. I'm simply saying that uh, some people look at us and saying, well, you guys think you, you, you know it all. No, we know the only one. We know Jesus Christ, and we know that he is God and only God. And here's how we know, because we trace this back through this people, and uh, these people, God has chosen to show them how to do these sacrifices, and we learn from them. Now, <clears throat> some people may ask, why is it then in the scriptures that the fire is not to go out? Uh, that was my first question too. Okay, the fire is not supposed to go out, so why? <laughs> Again, the Bible doesn't tell us why. You know, and, I, and I'm thinking, God, you, you've put in us this curiosity. You, you've, you've caused us to, to want to ask these questions. I mean, if you wouldn't have done that, you wouldn't have given us teenagers because teenagers always ask us why. And... and and parents always have to come up with a question. And sometimes we're saying, because, because I said so. And, and you know why we say that? Because God says that that way, because I said so. He doesn't tell us why. We can surmise, but whether or not God tells us why doesn't change whether or not we have to follow his instructions. Do I hear a rousing amen, parents? Yeah, I mean, come on. So, so the fact is that God tells us that the fire is not to go out. Now, there might be some thinking about it, and some men who are much smarter and wiser than I am, guys like Calvin says that, that uh, because the temple fire was lit by fire from heaven, therefore it should not go out because how are you going to light it again? You know, I mean, if it came from heaven and goes out, then you're out. So um, that's one reason why it has to be kept perpetually going. Others say, well, the fire did go out, so it must have another meaning. It has, maybe it was a divinely appointed symbol, a visible sign of the in, uninterrupted worship of God. And another one, again, so these, these very wise men can't agree either. That's because God doesn't say exactly. Uh, if the burnt offering then is seen as a propitiatory, a propitiatory sacrifice or a sacrifice of atonement, then the perpetual fire serves as a reminder that we are constantly in need of such atonement. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's some understandings that we can draw from this, all right? Uh, we can understand from this constant fire, if this perpetual fire represents the presence of the eternal God with us, then it shouldn't go out. It should never go out. Fact is, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, what does Paul say? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, do not quench the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. In other words, do not allow the Spirit who dwells within us in this tabernacle, just as that fire represented the presence of God in the tabernacle of the Old Covenant, the presence of the Spirit of God represents, represents His presence within us. And Paul says, don't let it go out. Don't quench it. If we go a little bit further then, if that perpetual fire then points to our constant need for atonement, here's what it says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25. Consequently, he, being Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He always lives to make intercession. So that perpetual fire, the, a, a picture of the constant need for atonement, then the presence of Jesus is a constant reminder to us of his presence to ever make intercession for us. Now, <clears throat> the instructions to the priests in the Old Covenant were simply this. Keep the fire going. Today, we should learn from that. We should say to ourselves, keep 
the fire going. Keep the fervor there. Now, <laughs> if you're human, which I'm imagining most of you are, you know that sometimes that's the difficult thing, right? Even in approaching this book of Leviticus, you can start out with a real fervor and a zeal. I'm going to do this. About halfway through, you're going, boy, <coughs> it's boring. You know, and, and uh, if you're married, hey, come on. If you're married, you remember the fervor and the, the fire. Yeah, when you first met her and, and you met and touched and got married the wedding day. I mean, whoo, and, and, and then after a while, what happens? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The fire goes out. You need to stoke the fire. You know exactly what, what God's talking about here. Don't let it go out. And so the priests were very consistent in a daily discipline to not let this fire go out. The rhythm, I, and, and again, you, you, you think, well, pastor, you keep coming back to this. You know, it's the rhythm and the ritual that was so important to them that helped to maintain that. We lose that in our own lives. One of the reasons we lose that is because we just become, we just become so busy. The priests were very consistent, very disciplined to make sure the fire did not go out. And as New Covenant, New Testament priests, we offer spiritual sacrifices in, in, in praying and listening to God. We offer spiritual sacrifices in service. And so we too, if we're going to keep the fire going, need to have a constant worship with God, a consistent devotion, not a sporadic, hit-and-miss enthusiasm. And in, in my high school years, I went to a, a missionary school, Morrison Academy down in Taichung, we would have spiritual emphasis week, at least once a semester. And we'd bring in a, a preacher or a speaker, and, and he would come for the purpose of emphasizing spiritual things. And I can remember times, I, I, more than once, where it seemed as if my soul was gripped and I would come down front and I would pour out my heart and I'd be weeping because I want so much to, to live right and to, to, have a, to have a fire, to have a zeal. And man, take off again. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And just get to going again. And after a while, after a passage of time, you know, things begin to just get routine. They lose their meaning and significance and the fire begins to dwindle. And soon, you know, they were back in the way. Do I, do I hear anybody saying, yeah, I know what you're talking about? <laughs> uh, help me out here, folks. Am I the only one that goes through this? You know, so I see some of you nodding your heads. Uh, that's encouraging to me. Uh, and, and so uh, th there's, there's a need in our lives then to, to understand that we, we do go through, through these spiritual cycles, but the worship of God shouldn't be something we come all of a sudden with this great enthusiasm and then back off. It should be a constant, consistent devotion. And, and I believe that comes really with a rhythm in, in worship. You'll have to understand this is coming from a pastor. I think Sunday morning is a very important part of that. I really do. I don't think Sunday morning ought to be an optional thing if I've got time to do it, you know, or if it works out. I really don't because it, it, it's so vital to a rhythm uh, of maintaining that kind of, uh, of fire in our, in our lives. So that in addition to the worship, I, I really believe that God gives us a place where he wants us to serve him. I, I talked about seeing the obvious hand of God. Well, it's hard to, have a, to see the obvious hand of God if we're not in a place where we're actually serving. Now, I, I want to be very quick to point out, I don't believe the only place you can serve God is right here. I think God has given each one of you a mission field for you to be on. I think that God has given you, every one of you, the place where he has designed specifically for you to be his light, his ministry, where you're at. And that he wants you to have that... That, that service and that vision and that, and that fervor there to be used of him. And, uh, you know, when, uh, when Moses was out on the, uh, in the, um, uh, the wilderness, he saw a burning bush, caught his attention. I want to tell you, you're in a wilderness. Let people see that fire, that burning bush in you. And you know what? It's going to catch their attention. 
it can't help but do that. So in giving you that place of service, God has gifted you. And I believe this, that when you're serving God in your calling, using your gifting, there's a, there's a motivation and there's an excitement there. It goes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the groove. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's a sense you're, you're there, you're, you're, you're where God wants you to be, and you know that God's using you in that way. And, that, and um, you know, and I, I got to be honest with you, I, I get that feeling on Sunday mornings. For whatever reason, I, I like what I'm doing. Sometimes it's not always easy, and sometimes you have to say things that aren't really pleasant. Sometimes you show bloody, gory films in church and, and that kind of stuff. But, but you know, I feel like David that I have to do this. I, I have to do this because this is where God has gifted me, and this is my calling. And, and not everyone has to stand up front here, and sometimes it's not easy, and the knees are shaking. But, you know, whatever it is, when you became a child of God, God gifted you. He gave, gives you a calling, and it's not necessarily uh, going off to some far-flung land, although you're here in Taiwan. And, and so, but it's God has particularly given you what you need, even, and I, and I don't mean this to be something that's demeaning, but even if your ministry is just to your children, there's a wonderful blessing in that, in God giving you that uh, uh, gifting. Find it. Use it. Let that motivate you, excite you. And in the context, then, of explaining these gifts that God's given to us, you find that context in uh, uh, Romans chapter 7. Good night. It's 15 after, and I haven't even gotten into the sermon yet. <laughs> Aye, and I cut this thing short today. Uh, Romans chapter 12, you, you, need to, you need to see this. Because in, in Romans chapter 12, God is gifting and, and showing what these gifts are. And in that context, he makes a very interesting statement, which I think we need to, we need to understand that so that we also understand the importance of God's gifting to us. He starts out chapter 12 by saying we are a living sacrifice. That puts us in context. And then he goes on to tell us that um, uh, the marks of a true Christian abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This follows. I'm, I'm, I'm taking you back. This verse follows now what he begins up and saying in verse 4. As in one body we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we though many are one body in Christ, individually are members one of another, having gifts that differ members one of another, according to the grace given to us, uh, sorry, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. And he speaks about them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, if one who teaches in his teaching, if one who exhorts in his exhort exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, one who leads with zeal, the one who does the acts of mercy with cheerfulness, and then he goes down and he speaks about saying, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. He gifts us for those reasons. And so <clears throat> this morning, I, I, I want us to understand that it's important to keep that fire burning, to keep that fire burning. Now, for the priests, to keep the fire burning, they had to keep the fire clean. And keeping the fire clean in verses 10 and 11, there's the instructions about that. How do we do that? For the priests, they were tasked. This was their responsibility. We're priests now, okay? We've seen that. We're priests now. We have this responsibility of keeping the fire burning, removing the ashes. And for the priests in the old covenant, daily the ashes had to be left taken out. The leftovers, the unused portion, the portion of the sacrifice that did not go up in the aroma that was pleasing to God. Why? The reason they had to be removed because these ashes 
hindered the fire from burning hot and would eventually smother the fire and it would go out. Now, to keep our spirit fervor, we also need to remove the ashes. But let me make a very important point here, and I want you to get this and make it well, because I read several other pastors' renditions of this, and, and I disagreed with them on this point. The reason being, they all of them, often, not all of them, most of them said that the ashes were sin. I do not believe the ashes are sin here. We're talking about a holy sacrifice. We're talking about a holy sacrifice offered to God, and these ashes have been built up. These are not bad things, but just because they're not bad things doesn't mean they can't be a hindrance. Listening to me now, folks, we get our minds so caught up on this is sin, and so it's bad, but I want to say to you that sometimes good things can be a hindrance to what's best, and that's what we see in this passage here. Good things are a hindrance to what's best. Ashes aren't, aren't, aren't necessarily sin. These can be anything that would cool our fervor, that would hinder our flame, that would cover the fire of God within our lives. And let me suggest to you that our lives become cluttered. They become cluttered. And we lose our focus of what's important. And in a cluttered life, something's begin popping up and, and we've lost our focus and so we, we forget what's most vital and most important. And God is reminding his priests, the fire is most important. Don't let it go out. Yes, we give and sacrifice ashes on that, uh, sacrifice, uh, on that fire and there's ashes that are formed and these are holy ashes. But if they're allowed to collect they can, be, they can cause a hindrance and they can become a, a, a focus. And they're going to cause the fire to go out. And so we need to look at our lives and to see again. And I have to point out to you, well, let's keep right on track here. because uh, <laughs> When our lives become uncluttered like this, oftentimes it's because of hyperactivity. This comes to the busyness of people. We're just plain busy from early in the morning to late at night. We finally just drop into bed and get four hours of sleep and we're up again and at it again. And, and, and it's this hyperactivity. Folks, listen. When have you really taken a rest? A rest. When have you taken time to just, for maybe a whole afternoon, you sat with a cup of tea and reflected on life, your life, we're too busy. And there's a, there's a scriptural principle that's missing here in our lives. It's called the Sabbath rest. The reason for the Sabbath rest is to give us a kind of rhythm, there it is again, and a ritual whereby we pause in our life to reflect on our spiritual well-being. It's when we take the ashes out. We're too busy for that. Are we? I mean, really now? How many of you can say, Pastor, I, I'm very careful to take a Sabbath rest. I, I'm religious about my Sabbath rest. Very few people can be honest enough to, 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 to do that. But listen, I want to say, if you do not have time to take out the ashes, you are too busy in God's sight. It's hindering your fire. You get tired. You get worn out. The ashes are built up and the fire is going to go out. Hyperactivity. It's not a bad thing, folks. It's not a sin. You don't have to condemn yourself over it. But you have to understand, good things aren't always the best thing. We also need to consider too, and here's, here's another thing. My observation is for all of us, our jobs are very important. And I, would, I, would, I feel very safe in saying that most of you, your job runs your life. I'm, I feel very confident in saying that. Boss says to you, you need to work on Sunday? Hey, I understand. I'll be there. We, we do what they tell us to do because we think that we can't live without that job. Are you kidding me? You have more faith in your job than you do in God. 
This past week, I had lunch with Uva Maurer. Uva is the former headmaster at Bethany, and now he, he left that to begin well, his heart's passion was providing uh, education and care for disabled children. And um, without any income, without any hope of an income, and I said, Uva, how are you doing? He said, the money runs out. I, I didn't say it like that. I said, Uva, how are you doing financially? I was pointed. And he says, the money runs out the end of November. I said, well, what are you going to do? He, he said, well, I'm sure God will provide some way. You live like that? You're going to walk out of your job because, because you want to do what's right, what God wants you to, without any hope of an income? No, 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 no. We don't do it that way. I'm simply saying to you, a job is not a bad thing. It's not a sin to have a good job. It's not a sin to work hard at your job and to be very good at it. But the ashes begin to build up, and the fire goes out, and the job becomes more important. Let me give you another thing. Since I am a parent, families, children, become like gods in parents' lives to where their whole life is focused around their children. Now, children are not a bad thing. They're a blessing from God. But if we're not careful, children then become our focus, and they can also lead to a very cluttered life. So, moms and dads, it's also important that we look at our life and see that we have things in proper perspective so the fire doesn't go out. I, <clears throat> that's why I say to you that having ashes to, to, to remove, it's not like looking for sin in our life. It's looking for good things that are keeping us from what's best and what God would have us to do. Uh, I might add there's another thing which leads to, it's part of the hyperactivity. In the, and if you have children, I understand the hyperactivity when you have little children. I mean, come on. Uh, that's, that's, that all, that's, that's part of the territory. That's just what goes with it. But it's putting it into the right perspective. I suggest to you some time management would be very helpful. And this is why I keep saying to you, ritual and rhythm are not a bad thing. To be able to establish that in your life, to know there's coming a time where you get... <coughs> The batteries get recharged. There's coming a time when it's been set aside. We get to be quiet. We get to be silent. We get to take a deep breath. It doesn't happen often in our lives. And it can be very detrimental. How do we keep this fire going? We look for these ashes. For our fire to burn hot... We have to keep it free and clean from ashes that would be hindering it. I suggest to you that from, from Paul's suggestion, where he says, I, 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 I sacrifice myself daily, again, it's a, it's a ritual thing. It's something we need to do on a regular basis. I ask you, have you cleaned the ashes away to improve your spiritual life? What's it look like? And... Maybe you're dealing with sin in your life, but that, can't be, that may not be the only issue. Have you made an effort lately to stop and take an honest look at what is smothering your spirit? You say, Pastor, the, I, I just, I don't sense there the presence of God. I just, I don't, and, and I, when I talk about this fire, you know, <clears throat> we, we think of a roaring fire. I don't know that that's necessarily the picture. You ever sat behind, uh, beside a fire that was once roaring fire, but now it's just those coals, and those coals are hot. And there's a, there, it seems like there's a, there's a depth to that heat that just goes on and on and on. In fact, is sometimes those coals can be so intensely hot that left unattended, they'll go all night long. I think that that's what we're talking about here, that fire that, that where the... the, the, the um, the wood or whatever's on the, the altar there is being completely consumed and it's completely on fire. Not a roaring thing, but just this deep heat, thorough heat, through and through that's going to abide all the way through the night. It's 
going to take you through the storm. It's going to take you through that dark, lonely period in life. That's the kind of fire that can't go out. Have you made an effort lately to look at what might be smothering your spirit? The other thing about uh, we learn from these priests, not only keeping the fire burning and not only keeping the fire clean, but keeping the fire fresh, keeping it fresh. The priests added new fuel every day. The priests, after removing the ashes, there was fresh fuel. What are we talking about? After removing these ashes, they lay more wood on, and then immediately after laying more wood on, interesting note, the first thing they do after putting wood on this, fresh, on this fire, add another sacrifice. In that sacrifice, there's the oil from the fat that's going to cause that fire to take right off again. The Bible speaks about the oil of the Holy Spirit of God. And there are times in, in the, in the, in the Old, Old Testament they speak about the oil of refreshment, but then there's the oil of the fire of God. And letting the oil of the Holy Spirit ignite with us in us again, that fire. And again, again let me point out to you, oftentimes we talk, you, you know, we're thinking about this, this roaring flame. I, I don't know that that's what we need to be thinking about here. I'm talking about that thorough, total burning of that ember. It's just as hot as can be. And anything that touches that ember, it's going to take off. Putting that fuel back on the fire. How do we add that fuel? How do we add wood? Adding wood is like, is like adding that thing in your, that, that purpose in your life, that, that something that you know is going to fire your spiritual fervor. What is it? What fires up a sense of spiritual fervor in your life? You have to be quiet, and you have to stop, and you have to consider things. But before you can do that, you've got to clear the ashes, folks. It's the ashes are removed first. Then you can begin to think how to put on that fire, how to refuel it. Learn more from God. I have a suggestion for you. Yesterday, we did this seminar called How to Study the Bible. And we went through some things the first hour and so forth. The last couple hours, uh, we just kind of did a Bible study. And we went to 1 John and, and, and studied basically the first four verses of 1 John. We didn't really get much beyond verse 1. But the time that we spent on verse 1 was uh, at, the, at the end of the course, it's like, you know, the lights came on and people were going, wow, I, this is amazing. This is really cool. I, I didn't know this in, uh, uh, about studying the Bible. And just that little frame of time, a fire was lit. I'm saying to you this, that in the quietness, maybe what you need to do is just open up the Word of God and do some intense studying. Refuel the fire. Refuel the spiritual fervor. We can read the Bible. We oftentimes just do read the Bible. I'm talking about a kind of study that's going to fuel that fervor again. We're missing it, folks. We're missing it. We also need to look at the obvious hand of God in your life. You know what it's like when you see God at, mo at work? You, you know what it's like when you see how, how God has done something amazing in somebody's life and you go, wow, man, God's doing something amazing. And, you, and there's... There's an enthusiasm when you see what's happening in somebody else's life. It lights your fire again. So we need to be active in other people's lives and looking for the obvious hand of God in life. Adding fire is like sharing the gift of grace with others. So I ask you this question, folks. <clears throat> Something you need to take some time during your Sabbath rest that you're going to take this week. And that is... How is the fire of God in your soul today? Do a little inventory. If, if this is the altar of God and we're making ourselves a living sacrifice, how's that fire doing? Because the clear instructions from God is don't let it go out. Is it burning hot? Or are you on that last little ember? It's flickering. It's gasping for air. 
It's saying, clear away the ashes. Give me some breath. Pour on a, some new fuel and it'll take off again. And put on another sacrifice and, and renew that sacrifice and let the, let the oil from the sacrifice flow down and rekindle that fire again. How's it going? Is it clean? Cluttered? Filled up with superficial things? I, I worry about that even in our worship here. I think worship should be kept simple. But we need to be careful to keep our fire clean and to keep it fresh, to be adding oil from God's Holy Spirit. Let me say, folks, taking time to carefully tend the fire of our soul, it's not an option. These instructions are don't let the fire go out. And by the way, it shouldn't be considered tedious. It shouldn't be considered, oh, i got to work on this thing again, you know. Another one of the long list of things that we have to put on our to-do list, light the fire. In fact, is, it should be something that is considered an honor. The old priests of the, of the, coven, the, the priests of the old covenant, it was a blessed privilege to be the one to keep the fire going. And it was also a, a very important responsibility. Removing the ashes, it's going to be work. You've got to take all the ashes out, change your clothes, take them all outside the town into the clean place. You, you know, there's, in other words, it's making some physical and mental activity which you are actually putting good things away, putting them somewhere else so that you can focus on what's important and what needs to be done. It's not going to be an easy thing that's just going to come naturally or automatically. It's a work. But I'm making you a promise. It's a work with rewarding results in a renewed and a vibrant fervor in your relationship with God and Father. If we desire to be a people who experience the presence of God, that's why we're here. If we desire to be a people who want to experience the presence of God, we need to carefully and intentionally tend to the fire of God upon the altar of our hearts. We need to do it. Father in heaven, again, we learned from a long, long time ago and a practice that you gave to your priests a long time ago that has application to us today. Oh God, oh God, we, we want a fire in our heart and soul. There's a longing to draw close to you. There's a longing to sense that holy presence of God. But Lord, we look at our life and we see, how can, there's just so much going on. And so I'm asking you today, and I'm asking on behalf of all of us here today, God, that we would, in our schedule, make the time to put out the ashes, to remove them so that the fire of God can be renewed and trust that you will do just that in our lives. We pray these things in the name of all.